Hey, welcome to the City Life Family Podcast, a podcast for young and old. We are, our aim is to equip you for the work of ministry and encourage you along the way. I am with some of my best friends, amazing female women leaders across the City Life Family, Kristen and Amy. Amy, take us and Kristen, take us into what you guys do, where you serve. How did you get tied into this City Life Family? Hi, I'm Amy Wackerhagen, and I'm at City Light Council Bluffs, and I serve very part-time there on staff doing serving teams and admin, and then I also co-lead our Bible study. And I'm Kristen McDermott. I wear two hats, one with City Light Omaha and City Light Family, and I run at communications, content, storytelling. It's awesome. All the things. Normally, Kristen, we would not be around this table without your leadership, uh, a year ago or so, we started having this conversation of like, how do we start to leak content and really define values and help really shape gospel-centered culture across the City Life family? And you said, well, podcasts would work. Why don't we try podcasts? Why don't we just, and I was like, how do we do that? Could we do that? What would we do? And you're doing it. And you have helped. So normally, guys, every episode, this incredible woman is behind the scenes, making things happening. Uh, we're laying out content and speakers and all the things. And so, Kristen, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you. So the reason we're here uh, is we're having a conversation about developing female leaders, especially within the life of the church. And um, and so that's a conversation we want to bring you to in. Uh, you are both great leaders within your local context. Also, you serve in very different ministry contexts, so we should acknowledge that. So Kristen, you're here at City Light Omaha, really a large church, lots of resources, very established, multiplying. Uh, you're in Council Bluffs, a little bit of a different story, really healthy church, church planning church, just a little bit smaller with more limited resources. And so uh, it's good to talk about how do we do this in different places mm -hmm. where the resources might be uh, a little bit different in scale. Mm -hmm. And so, um, okay, so let's start the conversation of why did we feel the need to even have a conversation about developing women within the City Light family and within local churches within the City Light family? Um, take us into your heart and some of the conversations that have been happening and, and why this was really a shared need or desire. Do you want me to start? Well, two things. I think first, uh, the first Multiply Conference. Yes. Uh, we invited a bunch of women into a space and just started that conversation like, uh, what are your needs? Mm. Uh, what are you wanting as far as equipping, uh, as far as tools? Uh, where can we help, you know, one another? Uh, so the thought of a space, you know, uh, another resource um, where women can come together and uh, not only be equipped, but then also to be able to connect with one another. Uh, so that was the first, um, I think, birth of this. But then um, our leadership is awesome. They also uh, recognized uh, an opportunity for us to come together. And and I think the conference itself, LEAD, uh, was then um, led from there. And um, yeah, and that's yeah. how we got to, to the LEAD conference. Yeah, your two names have happened multiple times. So uh, we're here today because, you know, 10 years ago, one church started it planted churches, they've started planting churches, those churches have been planting churches, mm -hmm. and now this thing called the Light Family exists, which is a family of churches, multiplying disciples, churches, and church planting movements. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 10 years, lots happened, okay? A lot. But we're trying to have this conversation because everything's being shaped and formed, and we've had pretty intentional rhythms on how you develop elders, how you develop church planters, how you develop pastors. We haven't had as much definition about what does that look like for female leaders within the life of the church? But we are also noticing uh, that all of our churches have been marked with brothers and sisters co-laboring together. And so if we go down the list of 14, 15 plus churches, we could name strong, godly elders, males, and leaders. We could also ama name amazing women leaders that have actually helped co-lead in some capacity and really help build in the life of the church. So here at City Light Omaha, I love to tell a story about Sarah Butenbach. Sarah Bienbeck was one of our first people that we hired. She came in the life of the church. Uh, her husband, Bo, is a physical therapist. She is a mom working for in an apartment complex, literally leasing apartments and picking up cigarette butts and giving tours. And we said, you know what? We would love it if you came and like answered the phone and got the door and like maybe you could do a few things. And we had no idea what level of leader she was. She immediately took over serving teams and neighborhood engagement and over the last eight, nine years, the influence of Sarah Butenbeck has been massive. She's now on the City Life Family Board. Uh, she's on the City Life Fam Omaha lead team, impacting, leading city groups, missional communities, all kinds of different levels of leadership for Sarah. And we're so grateful for it. With This church would literally not be the same without it. 
I love to tell the story of Dory Peterson. She was retired and uh, she showed up and said, I would love to start serving this church. I have a heart for two things, single moms and administration, finance, and HR. And I was like, okay, well, we need both. And so she immediately started leading me a missional community for single moms. Women were getting baptized. It was so beautiful to see this woman as a primary disciple maker in the life of our church. Some of our very first baptisms came. Dory standing up front, baptizing them. And what that communicates to the life of the church is that you never age out of making disciples. I'll never forget that imagery. Then you look at Dory and she's got a little spreadsheet and she is doing all of the H, like all of our financial budget. And it was unbelievable how gifted she was there. She was just the person to do it. And then we eventually hired her. And now she's serving on the City Light Family Board, uh, helping do finance and treasury roles. So, she, I mean, we could go down all of our church plants. Amy, you've been one of those people. You started here in City Light Omaha and uh, helped lead missional communities, city groups. Now you're in Council Bluffs, leading a, a Bible study for women, getting equipped in, in the word, and even helping your fingerprints are on this new lead conference uh, that we've put together. So, 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 so fun. And I'm so grateful for it. Okay. Yeah, there are leaders in our church, men yes. and women. And I think if you're a woman on staff, you are leading. No matter yes. if you don't have a leadership actual job title, you're yes. leading. Yes. So, uh, yes. so blessed. Yes. I would love to hear from you too. Um, what are some of the things that like uh, you've seen uh, other pastors doing to help encourage your leadership? And um, just would love to make that really practical for some people who are maybe listening saying, I want this to be part of our culture at our church. Where do I even start? What do I do? Yeah. Yeah, I'll brag on CB a little bit. So I was co-leading the Women's Bible Study as a volunteer, and Doug and Eric still invested in my leadership and sent me to Charles Simeon's Trust, which is a workshop on helping you to teach the Bible better. And so they put a financial you know, stake in that by sending me. I've been able to go two years in a row, and it's definitely helped me in my ministry. And then they've also just looked around and seen other spaces that I can lead. For example, I taught in student ministry yeah. after taking Charles Simeon's Trust so I could put some of the tools into practice and then just see other women around the church. That is fantastic. Well, the main reason why I'm in ministry is because of that invite. Mm. I had a pastor, and that was Phil. Yep. Shout out to Philco. Come on. Uh, who recognized leadership qualities in me uh, and invited me into a position at uh, the New West um, campus that was about to launch. And uh, I, I don't think I would have known about first and mm. foremost an opportunity for this, um, let alone think that I could do ministry. It's like I wasn't a leader, let alone a, a ministry leader. I didn't see myself as that. But because someone saw that and then invited me into it and then supported and encouraged me, that's how I, I got onto the Omaha staff and into ministry. Yeah. So it was an invitation from a pastor. Absolutely. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Shout out Phil, Doug. Eric and CB. Awesome, awesome. I love seeing that. So we, uh, really the brainchild of some of the female leaders in our City Light family said, hey, what if there was a space where we could have a conversation, especially for women, to know that they are seen, valued, cared for. We want to make a deposit in the women leaders across the family. And so what would it look like to invest in that? Uh, so we did that. First annual lead conference just recently happened. And so I want to spend a little time debriefing some of the content and just to give context for some of our listeners, we brought in Katie Cole, who is an incredibly strong leader. Uh, she's also an incredible communicator. I was just blown away. I feel like I could have learned I was from too. her. It exceeded my expectations. Oh my gosh. She could talk to you about structures of staffing, HR, theology, culture. She is just great. But her specialty right now and the research that she's done is really thinking about this. How do you develop women leaders in the context of ministry. And I think that was birthed out of some of her. She shared some of her story and and how she had observed that maybe not happening in the early church and then others, she felt really encouraged and empowered and, and blessed by other leaders who invested in her. So one of the things that she said, and I wanna get to some talking points um, that she really summarized, but was really, really interesting. And I hope like if you're listening and you're elder or you're a person in a position of influence in your local church, she said that she looked at what are the key factors of a healthy church that is developing both men and women? And she said, we looked at different theologies. You would think uh, complementarian or egalitarian, maybe that would have an impact on who's better at raising up female leaders that didn't. Maybe you look at geography, Texas versus California or New York where things are different. Um, no, there was no difference there. Uh, old and young, um, is that a generational disconnect? Is one better than the other? 
She said no. She said the key is having healthy leaders that are in places of power and authority that are intentionally developing men and women that have act, give themselves access to uh, each other as brothers mm-hmm. and sisters, uh, that create pathways for development and resources. And exactly what you said, Kristen and Amy, looking at, looking at you as sisters saying, I see leadership in you. You have what it takes. God has gifted you. Mm-hmm. And so I wanna invite you into another step of faith. And so that is the key. So if you're lacking structure and pathways, really the heart of your leadership though has to be, I see brothers and sisters, I wanna create opportunities for both. Mm-hmm. And I wanna see and speak to both. So uh, yeah, go ahead, Kristen. Well, I was gonna say, Katie gave us, I think a really important stat that I never mm-hmm. uh, considered. And you know, churches are made up over 60% of women. Yeah. And shouldn't then, therefore, leadership yes. reflect that diversity? And uh, I think this has you know, given us tools to now consider that, but then to run after it as well. Yeah, the word language she used says women are the majority in the local church, which is just true. 60% or more of your church is women. And women are the vast minority in leadership positions. Less than 15% of high-level leaders within a local church are women. And so mm-hmm. how does that how does that work right. and what are the opportunities there? So a couple of things she said to help um, really think through how do we actually start to address this issue and do this well um, is she said four things. One, we need to clearly define our theology. Number two, we need to reach beyond the sticky floor. Number three, we need to leverage our authority. And number four, we need to always take two. So let's just take some little time talking about those. And um, she said, clearly define your theology. And Kristen, what is, what's your takeaway on some of that? Well, yeah, you need to tell and communicate and practice with not just the women and the men on your staff, but within your church, yeah. where is the line? The line define it really clearly. And what we mean by that is, you know, what are the roles of women? Where, um, where are the boundaries? Are there boundaries? Are there more opportunities? Uh, so I, I appreciated that because I think it's easy, especially as a ministry staff to just to go run hard at, um, projects, at ministries, at people, but not really Mm -hmm. understand, um, I think the parameters and yeah. the lines of, of how to and where to do that, especially with as you're co-laboring with men and women. So define what is the line? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. So, yeah, and specifically the theological boundary, right? So for women's roles within the local church. And um, I know we were talking about this, like really at, at City Light, across the family, we're a complementarian uh, structure, theological belief. And so we believe males are, and men are uh, elders, called and qualified elders. But at the same time, a lot of times we start this conversation with what women can't do as far as authoritative teaching on Sunday morning. But we don't ever talk about what they can do. And so, Amy, where have you guys started to see this in Council Bluffs where we're saying we're starting to encourage people. This is our line and, and we're calling women to it. Yeah, so I really appreciate it as a staff team. We just took the time to say, what are we doing well as far as elevating women in leadership and where's some room that we could grow? And one of those is we noticed that women just don't have a huge stage presence mm-hmm. other than worship team. And so we are like, there's no reason they can't be reading scripture and praying for the pastor before he preaches. And so now I'm actually working on a scripture reading team that's primarily female. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting a couple women that I've asked, they're like, oh, I've always wanted to do that. But they've just never thought to say, hey, can I read scripture? And so it was just that invitation of calling them into it. So good. Yeah, we think about our church, even at City Light, Omaha. I mean, we're talking about how can we make them visible within the life of the gathering, right? So scripture reading, worship leading, communion service, prayer team in the back, all of those different visible, viable gifts of being used. And then outside of that, um, what's the line in uh, city groups or counseling environments or student environments? Um, where where does that look like? And we want we want to say this, ladies. God has given you guys just different gifts. All the same gifts that are given to men are given to women. So leadership, teaching, uh, counsel, and discernment. God has the Spirit of God has given men and women those gifts, and we just need to find the right environments to actually make that happen. So I loved her th- thought, though, that basically the unforgivable sin in most churches is women who are too aggressive and try to vie for leadership and overstep the line. And so because that it's the unforgivable sin that you just seem to cannot, you can't come back to, you get labeled as power hungry or whatever, women naturally 
they they don't even know where the line is, so there's confusion. But they so they shrink so far back from that line that uh, they're way way underneath it. So she tells the story of you know we're praying before the gathering starts, all the serving team leaders, and you've got a guy that's going to help with parking and a woman who's going to help with communion. And she looks around the room and she's way more mature spiritually. He might not even be a Christian. He's just in the church. He's ready to serve. And and she looks around and says, I can't pray out loud because I'm wearing the context of a man. Like that's just not biblical. Right. That's just not mm-hmm. even in the New Testament. But there's so much fear that I'm going to be seen as unsubmissive or authoritative or not respectful that I've got to back away from the line. Mm-hmm. And so... So what an opportunity to define that line. Yeah. But then I really encourage the women, if you don't know what that line is, ask. Yes. Create those spaces of conversation. Yeah. I think uh, that's another thing I heard from Katie is we should be having these conversations on a regular basis and there is no shame for asking. Yeah. Where's the line? Yeah. Advocate. Yeah. So sure. second thing was uh, the sticky floor. So reach beyond the sticky floor. And... Um, you know, one of this was just like we've heard about the glass ceiling, right? So uh, maybe years ago, especially in corporations, all the CEO, CFOs uh, were men. And so there was this level of leadership in most organizations that just women seem to not get through. She, she said, that's actually still true within the life of your church. It's not so much a glass ceiling. It's the glass floor or it's the sticky floor. And what she meant by that is it seems that women look at job descriptions and say, I can't do it. And I won't apply for it. And no, I'm afraid to fail. And so they get stuck not moving forward. And I just want to ask, have you guys seen that? Uh, uh, Have you experienced those dialogues in your head? Have you seen other powerful women? You just know they're gifted, but they're they're not moving forward and stepping into spaces of leadership and influence within the life of the church. So, yeah, talk to me about how that landed with you, Amy. Yeah, it was really interesting. I just would have never thought of that on my own. But then when we were talking as a staff team, I mean, these really great women leaders that we have serving in our church said, that's totally me. Like, that's how I think. And it was just across the board. And so that was really eye-opening as I'm thinking about inviting women into serving in our Bible study environments and our serving teams. So Katie mentioned that you, when you're recruiting, can say, I see leadership in you. And it's okay if you don't do everything perfectly. You don't have to meet the job description 100%. Mm -hmm. We can train and help you grow in that area, but we want you in this role. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. that's so good. Yeah, any other thoughts on that, Kristen? No, I I agree with Amy. Um, It really can change recruiting differently, therefore the culture and the definition of your staff team. And then that just trickles down to the church. Yep, Mm -hmm. yep, yep, exactly. She told some really great stories and examples about, um, you know, like men and women, the differences, like men, they look at job description and be like, I can do at least half. Like I'm getting this job, you know? And women be like, I think I do 85 well, but I'm not going to take it, you know? And you're like, that's just, and so really she pressed, especially pastors, elders, HR directors, people that are in charge of like kind of finding leaders. Typically we look for somebody who's already doing something, has already stepped forward, seems eager for the next thing right so you've got this this person who's an apprentice city group leader shows up bible studies done very responsive you're like that's probably the next person you might not the same capable woman leader might not be doing that because they're they're so afraid they're going to fail and so when you look in the room and say who's the next leader you're typically looking for the person who's shown such a desire to get to the next level and so you you need to kind of almost adjust who you're looking for. Who's stuck on that sticky floor that has high character, mm-hmm. tons of untapped gifts. They just need to see somebody say that you have what it takes. Take a step of faith. I'm with you. It's okay if we fail forward. Let's let's go together and take this gospel risk. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah. And I'm willing to invest in you. Yes. E- you know, equip you with what other training that you need with yes. other, yeah, yeah, education. Next one, she said, Le- leverage your authority. And she told this amazing story of how um, men and women get introduced differently and she said she really called men elders to really use what our authority is within the life of the church um, to really value women leaders and she noticed this thing that when men would get introduced it would always start with an introduction of their accomplishments here's the book they wrote seminary they went to the church they led the project they gave leadership to And so they come and they're just immediately given tremendous influence and authority because of their accomplishments. 
when women leaders are introduced within the life of the church, it's typically, well, we've known her forever. She's a good girl. She's so awesome. <laughs> She's been over. Our kids love her so much. She's and got great hair. Great. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Look at this woman's hair. Her hair's amazing. You know, and it's just all these things and they're might be all true, but they're so relational in nature. And that actually doesn't, especially men, doesn't give them as much credibility. And so it's one of the subtle ways that leaders can be undercutting women leaders within the life of the church. And so any other things that kind of stuck out on uh, that that one right there? Yeah, it's just kind of funny how. Well, for me, that was one of my biggest takeaways is offering the same words and yes. the same spaces yes. to everyone on your yeah. team, yeah. men and women. Yeah. So those words, use biblical words with yes. women else, yes. also. Yes. You know, show them the characteristics that they yes, um, show they in the body. E- exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, those spaces that you offer to yep. maybe those men on your team, those yep. lunch spaces, those um, f- uh, baseball or not baseball, but basketball court yeah, spaces, yeah, yeah. any of those spaces, there is um, coaching, there yep. is sponsoring yep. and yep. mentoring happening in there. And even though you are having fun, yes. uh, just exude and uh, invite those spaces yeah. to women as yes. well. Yeah, Kristen, you touched on a really great point. That was kind of her final thing is that there's been a culture in the church at really a couple of extremes, but one of them is like the kind of the Billy Graham rules of like men and women can never be in the same place because some level of, of sexual compromise can happen. And she really challenged that. She said the spirit of God is one of self-control and really what we need to start thinking about each other as in, in ways in terms of the Bible which is one of where we're brothers and sisters. And so uh, is that possible? Absolutely. And um, and if you've ever, you know, some of the other podcasts that have come out with Mars Hill and others, it's it really talks about how um, the church can really talk about women in a way that they're there to be a seductress or pull people away from the things of God. That's just not how scripture calls. And that's not the intention of most of the women that I know in the life of the church. And so she said, how do we, what happens is if you start to buy into that is you adopt these rhythms in a church that actually prohibit women from experiencing environments of growth and development. And it happens really subtly. And it just talked about it. So if I go to a a hospital and I'm going to visit somebody on, you know, in their room because they're sick. If I have the Billy Graham rule, I'm probably just grabbing a young male staff and saying, I want to model this to you, come. Which is well, great. That's, that's great, but they, again, who who didn't get the invitation? Mm-hmm. Immediately, just subconsciously, I made a decision not to take any sisters, where I could have taken a man and a woman. I could have mm-hmm. taken both, or, uh, or exactly the example for lunch, right? Pastors are going to lunch. Do they ever take anybody else, like men and women, to lunch, or is it just always men go to lunch? And so, uh, are those environments open? Traveling to conferences, right? A lot of times, it's like, well, I don't want to travel alone, so I'll bring somebody, but I can't. I don't want to bring a woman because that would look weird. And so, but again, her point would be, you don't need to compromise your conscience, but could you invest in bringing two or three, two men, two women, uh, a man and a woman, um, and, and and just so that both places and people and genders are given equal opportunity and access Mm -hmm. to those environments, right? So many pastors, we all have our, this is how we formally develop leaders and it's open for everybody. We've got classes and we've got studies and, but there's all these other ones that are oftentimes not, not Mm -hmm. maybe the case. And so Amy, have you seen that play out in the life of the church? And yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not going out to lunch with Eric or Doug. (laughs) And so, you know, but I think there are ways where you can celebrate your female leaders and have kind of that more casual kind of mentoring coaching relationship that's not compromising like you said so there's ways that we could be celebrated I mean maybe if I'm meeting at the church with them it's they're grabbing Starbucks on the way you know I think there's little things also that you can do to show the women that they're you see them they're valued they're cared for yeah. One of the things we've done here at City Light on Mall is we just developed our own paper on theology. So we're drawing the line on complementarian roles and what that looks like. So we've worked through that as a staff team. The other thing is we just recently added like our pastors. Um, we also added women to that room. So it's like uh, not as a pastoral voice, but just we call it the lead team, the Omaha lead team. So it's the pastors and two of the most, I think, visible uh, and gifted leaders within the life of our church, which is Karen and uh, Sarah Budenbach. And so they join us 
every week when we work through the agenda of the church. We think about finance board. We've uh, got Julia Kolar in that space. Guess what? Women are really great at math too. And so she helps steward all of uh, the finances of our church. And we're just so grateful for her voice there. So we've just tried to say, what are the rooms that we can actually have brothers and sisters in? And it makes the life of the church better. And exactly that example about lunch is, we started to say, hey, what if we took every ministry team out to lunch mm-hmm. instead of just the guys go to lunch after a meeting? We're going we're gonna to spend this time with our equipping team or our city group team or our next generation team, and those teams are all mixed men and women. So we're trying to get space to uh, invest and do that exact thing. So all that to say is we're trying to grow in this thing, and I hope that pastors are thinking, maybe let's just evaluate our culture. Let's start to have a conversation. It can feel uncomfortable. We don't always feel super equipped to have it. A lot of times elders, pastors, leaders are thinking, I got to get this next sermon done or the week thing. But man, these are really valuable, good conversations. So what would be your hope, Kristen, uh, as we look forward? No, I think this has been a great big win for our family. I mean, I'm so appreciative of our leadership. Um, First of all, investing into the space, uh, this lead conference, but then willing to uh, step into it with us. Uh, And then continue the conversation. So I think it's a big win. I'm super excited for our family as we go forward. And, you know, anytime we can put conversations and needs and perspectives into the light, growth and positive change occurs, uh, which then strengthens and unites the body of Christ, not just on our staff team, but in the entire church and then therefore in our entire family. And that is super exciting. Um, it strengthens our mission and vision. And I, you know, my ask is that we just continue leading this conversation. Yep. We continue asking, we continue putting it into the light. And, uh, I know we can do that. Mm. You know, Come I know on. we can. No, it gets me really excited. Amy, last thing, anything you want to rip on before we land this plane? I just want to give you opportunity. Yeah. I think I just echo what Kristen said. So at City Light Council Bluffs, we had a whole staff meeting where the mm-hmm. pastors were very humble and said, Hey, what are we doing well? But then also what are we not doing well in regards to developing female leaders and really any leaders? Cause it's male and female leaders in the church, you know, collating. And so I think that was just awesome. And then we're having ongoing conversations now and it was just a great space for the women in the room to say, yeah, that's really great that you do this, but you know, it would be kind of nice if we were able to do this in the church or if you could do this a little better. And so I just appreciate the humble spirit that I've Mm -hmm. seen in a lot of the male leaders by asking, hey, what are we not doing super awesome that we could be doing better? And I just think that's really shows value to the women that you're saying that you want to hear. Yes. You honestly want to hear what's their thoughts. The posture of this conversation matters so much, right? It's not just where do you land theologically, but the gentleness and humility of the posture of listening. How are you experiencing this culture? Um, How are we blessing? How are we not doing it well? And having years to hear that without being defensive. Such a big deal. So love that you affirm that in your leadership. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Appreciate you two. And I hope that you guys were blessed and encouraged as you guys listened in. Thanks.